I want to tell you a story. And the story is about Selly, the red blood cell. <laughs> now, Selly enjoyed his job. You see, Selly's job is to go through the blood and carry oxygen. And so he puts four oxygen on his back and he'll travel and he'll float through the bloodstream going to whoever needs food. And so he arrives there, he gives it, and they're just oh so thankful to get the oxygen they need. It keeps them going, it keeps them energized. And so he enjoyed his job thoroughly. One day, as he was floating through the blood, and he's going back for more oxygen, he sees something unusual. And it's floating in there. And before he realizes it, it had stuck to him. And he tries to pull it off of him, but it just won't come on. It's like it, it fused to him. And this is somewhat troubling. Now, it didn't hurt, but you know, it's kind of weird. So, Selly goes back for some oxygen, but now he has a problem. He can only carry two of them. Because as you can see, two of those little dots are where two of those oxygen belong. And instead of being able to carry oxygen, he had something else on there. And so when Sully goes to feed people, he's not as effective. And so, you know, the different parts of the body don't get the oxygen that they want. And so they're sad. And as Sully travels through the body, because, you know, he travels everywhere, he gets to interact with the different cells and see how they're doing. And what he notices is that other cells have the exact same problem. So he meets up with the neuron. And the neuron, you know, he's supposed to think, but he gets these things attached to him, and now he can't think as well as he used to. And then he goes to the muscle cells, and, well, they just can't seem to lift as much as they used to, because they have these things stuck on them. And so, Selly, of course, contemplates his life as a red blood cell, and as he's thinking, he says, you know what? I'm going to go to the white blood cell doctor. So, Sally visits the doctor. And so, gets a checkup. And the doctor, his face turns very serious. He says, Sally, you've been glycated. And there is no cure. And so, the white blood cell doctor had no choice but to send Sally to the nursing home where he had to rest out the rest of his days, along with other red blood cells that were also glycated. The end. Isn't that a wonderful story? No, it's not. <laughs> but it is a somewhat true story, and it happens inside all of us. Now, my topic is somewhat called glycation which is a word you probably have not heard before. In fact, it's one I did not know about until last week. Now, the idea of glycation, believe it or not, all of you know about it. You just don't know it by the name glycation. But it's something that you see literally every day. Do you see the crust around the bread? That is glycation. Yeah, baking creates glycation. Now, okay, what is glycation? The idea of glycation is that you take a protein and you take glucose and they literally fuse together and you cannot separate them. So basically, if you have something with a carbohydrate like bread and something with protein, also like bread because it has both protein and carbohydrates, and carbohydrates are glucose, when you bake them, they stick together and it's permanent. So, and that's what gives bread its kind of crunchy taste, you know, that's why we like toast, because it's been glycated, it's been toasted. Um, fried food is also glycated. So, I mean, that's not to say that fried food is necessarily bad, it's just what happens, is the chemical reaction whenever you toast something. In fact, when they discovered it, they called it the browning effect, because it made stuff brown. Now, a little bit about your anatomy. Did you realize that you are made almost entirely of proteins? They are the Lego blocks of your body. 
Your fingernails, it's a type of protein. Your hair, it's a type of protein. The inside of your eyeballs, made up of proteins. Every functional part of your body, the proteins are the structure that builds it up. And when you combine these different proteins together, that is how your body functions. Now, glucose is essential for survival because that is what keeps you going. That's the energy that powers your cells. And so your body, the bloodstream, constantly has glucose floating through it. In fact, if you have too little glucose, you go into a coma and you die. So I don't want to say that glucose is bad because it's actually really good. You need it. It's just that when the two can get combined together and they stick, it can cause some difficulties. Now, because glycation affects proteins, this means that it can affect potentially everything in your body because you are made of proteins. For example, your skin. The skin cells are made up of proteins and when they get glycated, they actually form like these kind of like thin, I'm not sure what to call them. Anyway, these thin bonds that kind of stick the cells together, and that is how you get wrinkles. In fact, aging is glycation. It is your skin actually kind of fusing together so it's not as elastic and sticky, and it is permanent. You don't, see, you don't usually see people lose their wrinkles. It builds up over time. Um, another effect, well, that's the hemoglobin that you know, poor Selly had. The blue pieces on there are the glucose molecules that stick to the hemoglobin and impair its function. This is why you cannot have a red blood cell, or I'm sorry, blood cells live on average 120 days because they're constantly swimming in glucose. So, you know, eventually they just get so much that they're not really useful. And so the body recycles them regularly. This is a natural process. It is a part of you. Um, another thing is the blood vessels themselves, because the vessels are also proteins. And so as over time, as you age, you get more glucose stuck to the inside of your blood vessels. And just like your skin, they kind of like stick together and they don't, they're not as flexible. And so you can actually get holes and stuff. Um, glaucoma is caused by glycation because on the inside of your eye, the protein in your eye fuses with glucose in your blood, and that is why diabetics often have issues with glaucoma, because of the excess glucose in their system. Now, I don't want, to, I don't want you to get the idea that I am anti-glucose or anti-sugar or anti-carbohydrate or anything like that. Because like I said, you need it to live. And in fact, it would be very difficult to be a Christian and be anti-sugar. Do you know why? What's that? I cannot hear you. Yeah, basically everything has sugar. <laughs> if it has a carbohydrate, it has sugar in it in some form, whether it's one or many of them strung together. And moreover, the Bible tells us, eat honey because it is good. <laughs> I cannot be a Christian and say sugar is evil because this verse would rebuke me. Because honey is 70% sugar, 40% fructose, which turns into glucose in your body, and then 30% glucose and 30% minerals and proteins and other stuff. Um, so I do not want you to get the idea that I'm anti sweet stuff, anti-carbohydrate. No, no, no. But the Bible is balanced because what the Bible is anti is anti-excess. It is not good to eat much honey. Now, if you think about it, no, I'll wait to go to that slide. The normal operation of your body is that glucose flows at a fairly steady and constant rate through your blood. And yes, you're going to have glycation because that's just how it goes. It's going to, eventually something's going to stick. If I flood my blood 
with glucose, the chance of glycation increases greatly because the body is not able to handle the excess, and so it starts sticking to different proteins, and those sticky glucose, like porcelli, it does not come off. In fact, they don't know of any way to break those bonds yet, although there are some ideas. So they've done some experiments with this. This particular chart is with what's known as microglial cells. It's the little cells in your brain that are like the janitors of the brain. They scrub your neurons, maybe not scrub them, but they keep the area clean. They fight against you know, things that want to hurt your neurons, things like that. And so what they decided to do was to give the microglia a glucose bath. And this chart details the type of bath that they got and their survival rate in the glucose bath. So at the far left is the control. Basically, we didn't put any glucose in this dish. And then at the far right is we only put 10 micromolar. You know, my chemistry students now know what a molar is. Basically, it's a unit of concentration. It is very small. And as you can see, the glucose do fine in a small enough, I'm sorry, the microglia do fine in a small enough concentration. But as you increase the concentration, you start to have more glycation and eventually so much that some of those cells actually die. So no, I am not anti-sugar, I am anti-excess. Now, something like this tasty piece of blueberry pie, I don't think that's gonna do very much damage at all. It's one piece of pie. However, if my piece of pie looks like this, <laughs> I will start to have problems because the blood has a lot more glucose than it may want. And so, like I said, I am not anti-sugar, I am anti-excess. You can think about it in terms of our roads here at Washita. We do not have the luxury of smoothly, smoothly paved city roads. We have the privilege of having something that makes our feet more durable namely rocks <laughs> and gravel. And now, if I take my shoes and I walk on a city road, the shoes are not going to get damaged very much. Or if I drive my car on there, the city road is not going to do much damage to my car. If I walk on the roads out here, I'm still going to be able to walk for a long time. It just creates some extra wear and tear. And the same for driving cars out here, that you know, sometimes you hit a pothole and bad things happen. Whereas on a smooth road, that's not such a problem. That's somewhat the difference between eating normal amounts of carbohydrates and sugar versus bombing your system. If you bomb yourself with lots of it, you'll live and you'll live for years. I, I don't know of people that have died from eating too much cake, at least, you know, right away. But you do that enough times and you get more of this glycation stuck to the inside of you and your body erodes faster than it was meant to. Now, I personally am a big believer in making investments. Um, for example, the bike that I own was very much an investment. Um, most of you already know that I have an electric bike and it cost me $1,000 to buy that thing, um, which is expensive. I mean, you don't just put $1,000 on anything that you just happen to want. It's, it takes a sacrifice to buy something like that. I did it because I want to take on an investment mindset that by having this bike, I will actually make back that money and more because the cost of driving 2,000 miles in a car, if you figure it at 50 cents per mile, which is roughly what people calculate, that's $1,000. And I drive back and forth from here to my house in town about 2,000 miles in a year. In other words, every year that I own the bike, I save $1,000. Every time I bike here and back 2,000 miles, I am saving this cost of the bike itself. So if I own it for three or four years, it's going to help me. Now, yes, I have to go through the rain. 
I get to be chased by a big white dog. That's why I got the electric bike. <laughs> then, <laughs> you know, that dog, all he can do is keep up with me. He can't get me, but he runs. And, but the electric bike, it keeps me going. <laughs> so, you know, there's perfectly good bikes for $600, but I don't want to be caught by that thing. No way. <laughs> So it was an investment in my own safety. Now, and it does take a little longer to bike from my house and here, it takes me about 30 minutes. Whereas driving takes me about 15. But on the upside, again, I'm saving $1,000 a year. I'm getting 10 miles of biking in every day. And honestly, I just enjoy it. It's, it's fun to bike like that. So I like to take on an investor's mindset when thinking about these things to pay a small price now to get a big benefit later. Now, why am I telling you about my bike? Because this is not about my bike. They have done studies altering the amount of glucose that you give rats. And so what they'll do is they'll give, you know, this rats a regular rat diet and they'll give rats a diet low in those glycated end products, basically the results of glycation, where you stick the glucose to the protein. And this is what they found. The, the clear squares, that is the normal diet, and the dark triangles, that is the low glycation diet. And on the bottom is the number of weeks that those particular rats lived. And if you do the math, the ones on a regular diet, the last one died off at 121 weeks. The ones on the low glycation diet died off at 140. Now, if you calculate that, because I'm a math teacher, this is what I do, that is a 15% increase in lifespan. That is significant. If there was an investment with that involved money that gave a nearly guaranteed 15% return, a good return is considered to be about 5 to 7%. If there is something that would give you 15% of your money back, I think some people would kill to take advantage of it because it's really good. So I figured my own personal situation, I'm 36 years old, and so I figure, okay, I'm 36, now, a lot of my family died young, but that's because they smoked, so I'm assuming that I'll, I'll probably get to like age 70. Um, now, Jesus could and hopefully will come before then, but we should live as if you know we're gonna be around for a while too. So I figure, okay, I have 34 years left of my life. If I am careful, that does not mean I never eat dessert. It does not mean I never have honey, it means I don't bomb myself with glucose. If I am careful, I will add about five years to my life from my current age. 34 years plus an extra 15% is roughly about five more years. Now, at your ages, it's even better. At your age, I'm gonna say that roughly the average age is 20. Um, so let's just assume that you're all 20 years old and you make the decision, hey, let's be more careful. This is your result. You will get an extra seven, and, on average, extra seven and a half years. Now that does not take into account car accidents or you know, acute forms of death, but if you are careful, you can expect a significantly longer, more useful life. Does that mean you never eat dessert? No, it just means be careful. Yeah, now I don't expect you all to make the type of investments that I make because I have my own reasons for doing what I do. Personally, I don't eat a lot of dessert just because it's like, you know, I don't really need it, so I don't. But, <laughs> yeah. But that's not to say if somebody eats dessert that they're a wicked person. That's just how I do things. And trust me, I still eat plenty of sugar. My wife makes good granola. And it's very tasty. And yes, it has sugar in it. So I don't want you to get that idea. The thing is that I have learned to be careful, especially because younger in my life, well, younger in my life, earlier in my life, 
I had serious issues with sugar where I would drink six to seven sodas a day um, because my fridge downstairs, my parents would keep it stocked with an unlimited supply of soda. And I mean unlimited. If it ran out, more would be bought. And so I would drink and drink. And I was a computer nerd, so I would sit at the computer and drink and drink and drink. Now, this was all well and good until I hit age 18. Because I think I've told some of you the story before, but it's worth repeating that I was in the shower. This was about a week or two before graduation from high school. And I felt kind of dizzy. And I felt my heart rate, because it's like, I don't know what's going on. My heart rate was 180. My normal heart rate is like 60. Now my normal heart rate is like 40 or so, but back then I wasn't so healthy. And when I realized that, I basically stumbled out of the shower and just about passed out on the floor. I almost fainted. And I'm like, I have no idea what happened. I went to the doctor. Doctor's like, uh oh. And so life went on. <laughs> and then the next week, I had a sleepover at my house. And during the sleepover, I bought a tub about this big around of gummy worms. And I ate the whole thing. 24 hours later, like clockwork, the same thing happened. I felt dizzy. I could hardly stand up. I thought I was dying or I'd have like a stroke or something because my head was just swimming. And it was scary. It was frightening. And after that, every time I would eat something heavy in sugar, the same thing would happen. I remember working late one night at a forklift job, and I had a Snickers bar. Snickers bars aren't that big. But 24 hours later, after eating that Snickers bar, whoa, what just happened? I drank a glass of orange juice, and 24 hours later, when I'm sitting at my computer at work, same thing, I feel dizzy. So, in a sense, I don't expect you to make the same decisions I've made because I've been forced into a corner, just about. I can't do those crazy things because I abused myself for a long time. But praise God that he lets me suffer for it so that I can reform. And now I know about things like this where if I'm careful, using it in moderation, the occasional dessert, the granola, whatever, you know, I'll live, about, I'll live quite a bit longer than I would have otherwise. So no, I am not anti-sugar. I'm anti-access. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, I thank you for forcing me into a corner before I knew about these things. I ask that you would help each person here to make their own decision about how much is good for them, that our bodies may last, and that we would be fit and healthy even to our 70s. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching our assembly here at Washita Hills. We hope you received precious information. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. Also tap the notification bell before you go so you know when we upload the next program. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Links are in the description below. Have a great day. In the meantime, stay safe.